Hello and welcome back to Football Daily, where this week we are looking at how Roman Abramovich changed football forever. Provided Mike Ashley doesn't have one final trick up his sleeve, next season Newcastle United will be the latest club fast-tracked into football's financial elite thanks to the riches of foreign investment. Their takeover comes just 17 years after Roman Abramovich came from nowhere to rescue Chelsea and use his billionaire status to shatter the power structures of European football. Since his arrival, no Premier League club has won more silverware domestically or abroad than the Blues. The deal and subsequent success created a blueprint that many billionaires have copied since, with the purchases of Manchester City and PSG by state-backed figures pushing club ownership to new extremes. But what were the events that led to arguably the most important takeover in modern football history? This is everything you need to know, the series where we give you the story behind some of football's defining moments. Today, Chelsea may be valued as the sixth wealthiest football club in the world, but back in 1982, former owner Ken Bates was able to purchase the Blues for just £1. At the time, Chelsea were languishing in the second division of English football, playing to an average crowd of just 13,000 and strangled with debts totaling £600,000, which 30 years ago was a significant amount. More importantly, the £1 deal did not include the freehold to Stamford Bridge, which in turn was sold to property company Marler Estates, who were determined to develop the lucrative site once the club's lease expired in 1989. However, Bates wasn't phased. He may have quickly restored Chelsea to the top division and made them top six contenders again, but his legacy remains his dogged determination to secure their iconic stadium over the next 10 years. By endlessly delaying their lease expiry with court cases and litigation, he prevented every attempt to turn the stadium into luxury apartments. Part of his defense was his creation of the Chelsea Pitch Owners Initiative, which helped raise enough funds to buy back the stadium in 1992, keeping it in the hands of supporters. Finally in control, Bates began to shape Stafford Bridge as it is seen today. They developed the Chelsea Village around the stadium with its numerous hotels, bars and flats, as well as constructing the Matthew Harding Stand, renovating the Shed End and expanding the West Stand. It meant by 2003 that Stamford Bridge was a quality facility, in a time when most clubs in England were still playing in historic though run-down arenas. Unfortunately, financial woes continued to trouble the club. By the 2002-03 season, the club's debts had risen to £90 million, and the club's chief executive, Trevor Birch, had to warn the players that failure to qualify for the lucrative Champions League by not beating Liverpool on the final day of the season would be the difference between them staying a top club or collapsing. In a match dubbed the £20 million game by the press, Jesper Gronkia became a club legend thanks to his winning goal, as Chelsea came from behind to win 2-1. Frank Lampard later wrote, I look back now and wonder what would have happened had we lost. I can't imagine. I don't dare to even think about it. By that point, Chelsea had been searching for investment in the club for almost 18 months, but to no avail. The collapse of Leeds United had ruined the attraction of financially perilous clubs to investors, while the CPO structure put off parties with ulterior motives. After 20 years of ownership, Ken Bates felt he had taken the club as far as he could. It just so happened that right at this moment, a little-known Russian oligarch was in the market for a football club. Type Roman Abramovich interview into a search engine, and you will be lucky to find any concrete evidence of him speaking to the press. In almost two decades of Chelsea ownership, the 53-year-old has conducted just one interview with the English media. He has always been a man who's let his actions speak much more loudly than his words. Abramovich was born into a Jewish-Lithuanian family in 1966, in the former Soviet Union city of Saratov. But at four years old, he was orphaned and raised by his grandparents. Fast forward 25 years, Abramovich was carefully rising up in the murky world of Soviet business. His true ascension to fortune and wealth came during the presidency of Boris Yeltsin, who became Russia's first leader after the Soviet Union broke up in 1991. Yeltsin pushed through a number of painful free market policies and sold off government assets to wealthy businessmen at reduced rates. In 1995, Abramovich managed to purchase the oil company Sibneft for $150 million, a deal that made him a billionaire overnight, with the company's real value closer to $3 billion. Unfortunately, these reforms led to economic collapse in Russia, and in 1999, Vladimir Putin rose to power, vowing to destroy Yeltsin's oligarchs and return the wealth to the state. Fortunately for Abramovich, he was on friendly terms with Putin, and widely praised as a good governor of the Chukotka region. However, the average Russian still looked at his wealth with suspicion, and it has been suggested that the idea of buying a major football club was pitched to Abramovich as a way of improving his public image, as it would create an international profile away from business and politics. It also served as a means of diluting his liquid assets, making them harder to reclaim. 
Though it can't be proved, investing in sport was a smart move for someone in Abramovich's situation. Whatever the reason, by 2003, a billionaire who had shown no previous interest in football headed to England in search of a club, but Chelsea weren't the only team on offer. Having failed in attempts to buy either Dinamo or CSK Moscow in his homeland, Abramovich turned his attention to England, where football was far more commercial thanks to the success of clubs like Arsenal and Manchester United. In order to help find the right club, Abramovich enlisted the help of super agent and fixer Pini Zahavi. The Israeli pitched a number of sides to him, including Arsenal, Manchester United and Portsmouth. But in reality, the most serious contender that emerged was Tottenham Hotspur. However, this deal never went ahead. Tottenham's tough chairman Daniel Levy would only offer Abramovich a 29.1% stake in the club, but the Russian wasn't looking for part ownership. And that is where Chelsea came into play, as Ken Bates was prepared to give Abramovich total control over a club that by 2003 already contained the potential for Premier League glory. It is telling that various members of Claudio Ranieri's side in 2002 would continue to provide success in the coming years, including John Terry, Frank Lampard and Ida Good Johnson. So eager was Abramovich to buy that negotiations between him and Chelsea took only a week to conclude. The fact they had secured Champions League football, boasted quality infrastructure around the Chelsea village and sat in a billionaire's safe haven of West London made the club an attractive proposition despite their financial issues. On Wednesday the 2nd of July, the £140 million deal was announced, the biggest in British football at the time. Ken Bates took home £17.5 million for himself, while Abramovich immediately cleared the debts that had been strangling the Blues. True to his word, that summer he embarked on a remarkable spending spree that saw 11 new players arrive, including Ernan Crespo, Claude Makélélé and Damien Duff to the tune of £121 million. Ten years later, his investment stood at a massive £2 billion, and any recent concerns he is growing tired of his pet project can be allayed by the fact in 2018-19 he put in £247 million of his own money into the club. Petty cash for a man who in 2005 was reportedly worth £15.9 billion after the sale of Sibnef to gas giants Gazprom. He may have famously claimed he bought Chelsea because he was bored, but in reality investing in the most marketable sporting league in the world was both a commercially and politically intelligent decision. Well, for side, Abramovich is now one of the most important figures within the Russian Football Federation. Football today may be a different place to the one he invested in, but as the Saudi takeover of Newcastle United shows, the allure and prestige of owning a top club is still very much alive within the billionaire's circle, 17 years after Abramovich got the trend rolling. And that's all we have time for this week, but let us know which topic you'd like to see covered next. And if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and subscribe to the channel for more great content. Bye for now.